what is it like being a Jamaican visiting Antarctica? Hi, I'm Xavier Murphy, founder of Jamaicans.com. And today in Jamaicans to the world, I speak to Judith Fallon Reed, who has visited Antarctica and is one of the first Jamaicans to set foot on that continent. No, I know today's broadcast is a little different, but you know, Jamaicans, they have to be the first. They have to do just, set, you know, they're on every, I've done every continent and the only one I haven't done is this one. And, and so Judith is here to tell us about her experience there. Hi, Judith. Welcome. Thank you, Xavier. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to be on Jamaicans to the world. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive into this. But first, where you come from in a Jamaica and which school you represent? <laughs> I'd like to tell people I'm a true Jamaican, right? Because for most people, they know me from Montego Bay because I went to Mount Alvernia High School. So hey, rep Mount Alvernia. Um, but I was actually born in Kingston, under the clock, at Jubilee Hospital. And my family moved to Mandeville when I was like two. So in my head, I come from Mandeville. And then most people know me from Montego Bay. So in their head, I come from Montego Bay. And then I, of course, went to Kingston for school and then lived in Ocheria. So I'm a real Jamaican, come from everywhere, but was born in Kingston, under the clock. So I know there's always this Montego Bay Kingston struggle. So you're saying you are bridging that gap. <laughs> I am the bridge. Yes. <laughs> I come from everywhere. <laughs> and which school again? Mount Alvernia. Hello. Okay. Mount Alvernia right. High School. The school right. on the hill. Okay. All right. Big up Mount Alvernia. <laughs> so now, you know, um, many of you may know Judith. She she has done um, quite a few things: author, speaker, motivational speaker. She has done films. Um, she's a broadcaster on Jamaicans.com uh, on uh, Shelf Life, and so on. And but I don't know how many of you know that she is a traveler, an explorer, and has done couple firsts. And and so accolades, I can't even start to pronounce you know the other day i think the city of los angeles honored you and, yes. and so forth and and so so i'm not even going to begin to touch on that i'll let you talk a little bit about that but before you talk about that so what inspire you to go to this cold cold continent where i mean i think that is where all ice in the world and snow in the world is manufactured what inspired yes. you to go there? Well, I used to be the writer as a writer, and I've been a writer my whole life. But as the writer for this cruise line that I was working with, which is the cruise line I went with, right? Small cruise line, because where we went, you can only take small ships with ice breaking hulls and stuff like that. And so we had one of those. And for years, I was writing for the travel magazines and writing for the cruise line based on research and stuff that I'd hear from the crew. And I was like, no, sir. May have to see this for myself. And you are right, all the ice in the world is there because 80% of the world's water is locked up in ice in Antarctica. So, yes, it's a lot of ice. Oh, but no. I tell you something, it wasn't that cold. <laughs> it wasn't that cold? No, it's the coldest place on earth, yes, that is true. But I went in the summer, um, the Austral summer, which is the upside down summer. Um, and I went in February, which is the end of summer for them. So it was like 35, 40 on an average, which really, honestly, in February, Chicago, North Florida, all these places were colder. Um, when you really felt the cold, though, was when you were like standing on land and the winds, them have some serious winds that come down and those winds start to bite. Or when you're on the little Zodiac boat going from the ship to land and you know you're going over ice cold water, at top speed, that's when you really feel the cold bite. But honestly, it was it was like being in Chicago in the winter. Okay, so I don't know what Chicago winters feel like. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave that one alone. And I don't want I don't know if I want to experience it. I've 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 experienced German winters uh, or a German winter. 
and and so uh, um below or whatever it's not even a snow it's a cold it can't even snow but that 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 i leave that there so it was cold but that's properly dressed so it wasn't bad all right and and so when you landed you know on i think you said you, there's a, a couple places you you touched when you yes. when you got there um what what's the experience like are there p i, I know I, I don't expect this but i'm just gonna ask a wild question anyway are there guides that are greeting you there or the guides with you when you get off um did you see any of these and i know i'm asking a ton of questions here <laughs> do you see any of these research centers that they say are there because again yes. people that live there they may spend a month two months three months and then they're off because it's only a lot of research is done there but did you what did you see what's that again ton of okay, questions. So <laughs> let me start with what i saw when i woke up the first morning right so to get there first of all you have to go to ushuaia which is the southernmost city in the world at the tip of south america and then sail across the drake passage which in itself can be treacherous going down it wasn't bad coming back it kicked butt um, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> um, but when I woke up the morning, I saw what to me and having traveled Europe and, you know, around the Caribbean and, up, and South America, what to me was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. It was just these jet black mountains with this perfect white ice and snow coming off of it. And just the, the most beautiful ocean ever. And that's what I saw when I woke up in the morning. And there were whales. You know, I got up just in time to hear people screaming because there were whales out there. I didn't catch any of them on camera. By the time I click in and they're gone. So I don't have any proof. But, <laughs> you know, there were whales outside there. Um, there was an albatross just going with the ship. This albatross that was guiding the ship almost like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And it was just amazing to see the scenery that you just don't see anywhere else on earth. It, it, it wasn't green, it was ice, but it was actually beautiful because it was the whitest, most pristine, clean ice I'd ever seen in my whole life. Wow. Um, so that was the first thing we saw. And then when we had to go on land, before actually making a landing, the first day we did touring around and they have these little rubber boats, I call them rubber dinghies that hold about 12 people called Zodiacs. And from the ship, that's how you get to shore or you coast around. And so that first day, first morning, I went out in a Zodiac and we went up to a glacier. So, you know, you see glacier in pictures and them look big, right? <clears throat> but when yeah. you are in a little boat up against a glacier and you look up, 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 and you look till your neck bend and you can't look no higher. That is a glacier. <laughs> and while we were there, we heard one carving dropping off piece in the distance. Right. Wow. And we were just happy it wasn't where we were. Right, right. And of course, as far as it was, it rippled the ocean. So those are some of the things that I remember that kind of stuck with me. And that was my first shot at seeing some penguins on land because we hadn't landed yet. Um, swimming around and playing with each other and seals on the land because we where we were we couldn't land at that point so that was really my first thing and so, then our first landing was at waterboat point and that's where i learned that all the penguins in the world are not pretty and white and clean some of them muddy and dirty and stink <laughs> well <laughs> because well, you could smell them we're used to seeing them you know where they're in the zoo or kind of like set for display i guess so you know in their real habit you know where they really live them oh. don't they not care they might do for them thing <laughs> they not care and and what about point is where one of the research stations is the chilean research station the gabriel gonzalez vidales and i i practiced that one right research station and uh, the interesting thing about that research station is that it's open three months out of the year because you can't live there year round. It's too cold. They tried to open it 24 seven year round and it was impossible. Uh, people couldn't stay. So, and they couldn't get supplies in and out. So they, it's open three months out of the year. 
And researchers from all over the world use that research station. So even though it's a Chilean station, it's used by people from all over the world, researchers. They have a Chilean station, an Argentinian station, and of course, America has McMurdo, which is on the, the New Zealand side of Antarctica, which is a military base. So, so there, you actually got to walk with the penguins walking around you, but that place was kind of muddy. So the mm -hmm. penguins were dirty and muddy and um, penguin poop everywhere, which is pink, by the way. <laughs> pink. Pink. Penguin so, poop is pink. So the pink on white it is probably pink quite on display. white on mud on. That was the first <laughs> landing. It was it was actually quite a shock. Because, you know, you're so used to these pretty fluffy penguins, all white and black, and then you get there. And these were gentoo penguins, so they're, they're big penguins. Not as big as the emperor, but they're big penguins. And they're just walking around in the mud, doing their thing. And you're walking around, you're making sure that you don't touch them, making sure that you're not in their way, making sure you stop when they want to pass. But it was fascinating to see that, you know, just these wow. penguins in their natural habitat. And it's seals. Yes, lots of seals. I actually fell in love with the seals. I must tell you, as cute as the penguins are, I fell in love with the seals. This, we had uh, about five, four or five different types of seals that I saw. Fur seals were the main ones that we saw a lot of. And they're called fur seals because they're actually furry. You know, if you look at them closely enough, and you can't get too close, but when you look at your pictures, you realize that they're actually a little furry. So they're called fur seals and there were a lot of fur seals. So those were really, really cool. Really cool to see. And and in terms of just you're on the land and you're looking around, okay? Is it just I know some of the mud is on the ground, but when it you survey the scene, is it just like an all white scene? Actually, no, it's not an all white scene at all because you know, you, you know, they talk about blue ice. It's a blue and white scene all around you. Ice blue. I mean, you see it in pictures and you think, eh, you know, it can't really that blue. But the reflection of the, of, I guess, the reflection of the sea, of the ocean right. on the white. And just some of that ice is so but, blue. It's unreal to see but, ice that blue. But let me ask you this. Is the reflection, is it a reflection of the sky or the Probably ocean sky, because, yeah. because I'm thinking to myself, is the ocean blue like our ocean in the Caribbean, or is it like more of a gray and you know? Hey, no, it's blue, but it's a deep blue. When they talk about deep blue sea, yes, it's a deep dark blue. So yeah, I guess it's the reflection of the sky, but I don't know what it is. I just know that the the eyes blue. Blue, 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 blue. It's a pretty blue ice. And I talk about the muddy penguins, but we did a second landing <clears throat> at Half Moon Island. Now there, snow had fallen and the, the whole place was covered in snow. So the penguins there, which were chinstrap penguins, now those were the penguins that you see, the airbrushed penguins. They were all beautiful and white with their little black tuxedos and their little chinstrap, they're called chinstrap penguins. And there they were all nice and clean, and it looked like what we should have seen the first the first time. <laughs> you know, what you expect. Redo. To see. Rewind. Yeah, redo it. <laughs> it felt like a redo. But at the first landing, you know, at the Chilean research station, they have like a little museum. So that was kind of cool because it had pictures of just from whaling days and from showing you when the, the research station was being built and all this other stuff, you know. And you could buy souvenirs. So I actually bought myself a souvenir, which is a certificate showing that I'd been to Antarctica. Just in case one day anybody tell me something never go, I bought one which was authenticated and stamped to show that, yes, I had been in Antarctica. So it, uh, was, it was actually had something more than just looking at the wildlife. So, so folks, let me say this. I, I, I know Judith well, and if she could... She would have carried a flag there and and stuck it in the ground and says, Yes, we're there. Okay. However, from what I understand, you can't leave nothing back there. No. Take 
when you no. land there, you can't do no, 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 only pop, you can't carry on with no foolishness up there. No, they tell you straight up, you leave only footprints and you take only memories. So, you asked about guides, we had all these PhD people, zoologists and botanists and whatever on the ship who act as guides and some of the captains who act as guides, the boat captains. And so what they do is they put on this thing called the penguin police, a jacket, but they actually police the people who are on land and they spread out to make sure you're not touching anything, you're not interfering with any wildlife, you're not picking up no stones, you're not leaving anything behind. You can't bring any snacks with you because your time on land is limited. They only take small groups. I think like 24 people at a time or 30 people at a time could actually go on land. And that way you, would, you wouldn't have a crowd. It wouldn't interfere with the wildlife or anything like that. And yes, I would have planted a flag. But what I did do was I had a little flag on my cap, <laughs> on my dam. <laughs> so, yes, I had a little flag that was an Argentina, Jamaica flag. Right. And I had it right here, so on the cap. So when I took my picture, I make sure that I said, oh, make sure I get the flag, make sure I get the flag. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I had to make sure. I also had a picture of my grandson, who was much, much younger at the time. And um, I held up the picture of my grandson, and I said, okay, he's in Antarctica with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so those are the antics you can't go on with. You can't go on with no foolishness. Oh, they will oh, take that. you, put you back in the boat, and ship you back. Yeah, so so let me ask you this because it's a limited amount of people back then i i, I think things may have changed a little bit no that you're Still talking is. 2007 um right 2007 yes yes so I, I know things have changed a little bit there i've spoken to you know um you know spoken scene and some you know in iceland right the, the young lady i did from iceland um said you know hey she had visited you know a few years back but things have changed but here is what my question is so you are you are probably one of the only if you and i spoke you're the only black person on this expedition and you yep. probably had gotten some questions like jamaica and Arthur, why why <laughs> Tell me that experience because it takes a special type of person to say, I'm traveling and I'm going to this continent. And so you must have gotten some questions, not only from your family and your friends. And if you want to tell me about that, you can. But did, did you get some of these questions on the ship also? So start with well, the family and friends. I see you laughing there. Let, let me start there, all right? So everybody knew i worked for this cruise line and you know i'm a writer everybody knew i've been writing for travel magazines blah 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 so when i tell them i'm going to antarctica I, this is a truth now right i honestly honestly had some friends one in particular who said to me we have travel so far for the look for ice come to my yard let me open my freezer i'll show you what ice look like <laughs> if you want the ice my freezer wants to defrost if you want the ice we can show you ice <laughs> Um, that was one reaction. So you mentioned that there's only a specific period of time. I don't remember what was the term you referred to it at, that you can travel to Ant Antarctica. What you time? travel during what is known yeah. as the austral summer. So you know the world kind of upside down, right? So if you're on the southern hemisphere, winter is opposite to what we're used to up in the north, or on the northern hemisphere. So summer is November to about March. And it's called the Austral Summer, Austral having to do with Australia, Austral, you know, and all that area. And so that's when you can travel there because that's the only time that it is actually safe to travel. The waters are melted enough. But I have to say this, right, that since I went to Antarctica, there are a lot of cruise lines and a lot of trips that go to Antarctica now. But one of the things that I, I think bears worth mentioning is that um, where I went, all the as far as I go, most ships can't go there. You have to be able to go in a ship that has a steel strengthened hull or an icebreaker hull, just in case <laughs> you hit any ice, that you are safe. And so you have to go in the austral summer when the ice is, you know, roughly purely melted. 
and um, you have to go in specific ships to get that right. far. And it's warmer during that time. And it's so. warmer. It's only 40 <laughs> degrees. I mean, come on. You know? well, 40 degrees, you're talking to a Jamaican here. 40 <laughs> degrees, come on. That cold. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. You, you know, it's, it's kind of an expedition from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to know, you as a Jamaican traveling with, I guess you said they're they only allow a certain amount of people on. Yes. On um the, the, the probably the ship and the little boat. Again, I forget the name they call it. The, the Zodiac. The Zodiac. I call, um, I call it a rubber dinghy, but it's really a Zodiac. <laughs> all right. I, I do remember rubber dinghy. <laughs> so you have, you know, you had some people that you met. They they're probably one day, you know, this only probably black lady, Jamaican. Mm -hmm. And there probably was some curiosity from those passengers. Why would you want to go there? There was a lot of curiosity um, from, from passengers, I have to tell you. A lot of them. Um, some of them just, when they found out I worked for the cruise line, just figured, oh, well, she had to go because it's her job. But the ones that I actually spent time talking to got to understand that, you know, Jamaicans, we will do anything we will go anywhere we are limitless you know when i explain to them that listen we have a bobsled team because at the time you know we hadn't we didn't have the ski yet and all these other things but i'm like yeah we will do you know tell tell a jamaican something they can't do and that's exactly the thing that we're aiming to do and so i had a lot of really fun conversations explaining to people jamaican culture who we are as a people um who we are in terms of what we see the world as and how we see the whole world as ours and we just we, we, we don't have any limits and we don't want to have any limits you know i tried to explain jamaican culture in terms of especially since most of the most of the passengers were either american or british right and so i had to explain jamaican culture to them and they were all of course older because it's an expensive cruise so it's not some young people could do. I was the youngest person on the ship, and I won't tell you how young I was at the time. Let's just say it was. <laughs> let's just say I was the youngest person on the ship, right? I'm not that old right now, but um, yeah. So they were very curious, but Good. I had to explain who we are as Jamaican people, and how nice. we see the world different, and nice. how we don't see the world as this is something we can do or shouldn't do. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have to ask you this question because I know it was limited to what you could carry when you get on shore mm -hmm. and, and you're there. Did you take, this is way out there now, did you take any music with you to listen to while you're walking Hello. around? Hello. <laughs> you could so, take, like, what it, was it, um, was it iPod? iPod, iPod yes. Was out then. <laughs> Back in the day. Back so, in the so day. You only had here's where I'm going. I'm going. I know that the penguins and the seals couldn't hear it, but I'm just saying you took some reggae music with you on shore to did. Antarctica. So there is there was some reggae played there. Yes, yes. I actually bought myself an iPod just for this trip. Just for this trip. And, um, you know, back then, iPod was all there was. And I had my headphones in, jamming to my reggae music, and, you know, sharing it with the... Back then, it was kind of safe to do that, <laughs> sharing it with some of the journalists and stuff who were with me. So, yes, I was definitely jamming, jamming to my <laughs> reggae music. Yeah, jamming, jamming the whole time. Um, as I say, I couldn't plant a flag. I had the flag on my head and the right. music in my ears. So... If someone was to ask, why should I make this particular trip? Because for some people, they're going to say, like me, coal. Um, I can go to the zoo and see seals and penguins. And, you know, um, what, what would you say? And, and why would you encourage them to, to, to make this particular trip? Because Antarctica is the last frontier. Really, it is. Um, I, I say to people, anybody can go to England. 
been there, done that. Anybody can go to France, been there, done that. You know, uh, anybody can go to Argentina, been there, done that. But to go to Antarctica is a special trip. It's something truly special. It's something that you only a very handful of people get the opportunity to do. If you consider that Jamaica receives about 3 million visitors a year, and, and Jamaica is tiny, right? So Europe receives what? No, Hundreds sir. of millions. No, man, we're we'll tiny on the map. No, man, we're we'll tiny on the map. <laughs> on the map, we're tiny. We're not big, we're not tiny anywhere else. We're tiny on the map. Folks, I'm not responsible. <laughs> Okay, the opinion of Judith is I'm not responsible. So if you Tiny see comments on the there. map <laughs> <laughs> only, right? Um, but when you consider that, and that America receives hundreds of millions of visitors every year, and Europe hundreds of millions, but Antarctica only receives like 40,000 visitors per year who actually get to step on the continent, you understand the difference and why it is such a special thing to do and such an unusual thing to do. And in terms of the cold, if you've ever been to New York in the winter, if you ever go to Chicago, if you've ever been to England any other time apart from July and August, <laughs> then what's the big deal? You, know, you put on the right jacket, you put on the right shoes, you wear some boots, you know, make sure you're warm, and you go and you have an adventure. It's the adventure of a lifetime. It's more than penguins and seals. It's, okay. a, it, it's a scenery that you won't see anywhere else. It's a, it's a peacefulness, it's a tranquility in the air that you won't see anywhere else. It's a cleanness. That's a word, right? <laughs> it's, a clean, it's a cleanness that you won't see anywhere else in the world. And when you breathe the air there, for the first time in my life, my lungs felt like it breathed totally 100% clean fresh air. Nice. Um, nice. the, the sounds are different the sights are different it's not just penguins and seals people it is the last frontier it is amazing scenery and just something to take to say listen of forty thousand people and nine billion people in the world i was one of them and in awesome. my case i was the first female jamaican nice nice and i and i hear the sun sets oh I love sunsets. I'm a sunset, sunrise, sunset girl. I have a million pictures of sunset. The sunsets are just remarkable because there is no uh, disturbance in the air. There's no dirt in the air, no, no, no pollution to stop the sunsets. And so the sunsets are just absolutely brilliant. Yes. You know, night after yeah. night after night. So, you know, you're back from, you know, from years ago, you wrote about this. Um, you have a book. Tell us a little bit about the book. You also had a documentary mm -hmm. um, that you did about this. So tell us a little bit about both and also where can some folks who are interested to learn about it and Antarctica find it? Well, I wrote two books, actually. One book is called uh, Antarctica Adventures with a Jamaican on Ice, which is a children's book. I didn't start out writing the children's book. I started out doing the coffee table book, uh, Inspiring Antarctica. And how that came about was I had, while I was in Antarctica, I was writing a blog. We never called it blog back then. I think we just used to write emails and send them back, right? So I was writing these emails and sending them back every day with uh, pictures from the day's activities and everything. So I took all of those entries, blog entries, what are now blogs, blog entries, and I put them in a book with my pictures. I took over 700 pictures. And uh, the book has in about uh, maybe 50, 60, I don't even know, pictures of from the trip. And so that's a coffee table book, uh, Inspiring Antarctica. And then I did a children's book, which is like maybe 25, page, 30 pages, using the photos as well, and a nice little story told by Pedro the Penguin, which is educational, and the children, the, the, this children's book is what really sells, to be honest with you. Even the adults buy the children's book and prefer the children's book. <laughs> but if you want a nice coffee table book, you know, that's different than I Inspiring Antarctica is it. And the film goes by the same name, I Inspiring Antarctica. And that is footage I took while I was on the ship and while I was on the trip. 
Now, this is before HD. Let me just say that real clearly. <laughs> this is before I, I HD was, and 4K. I, I was about to say in 2007, the, the cameras, there were digital cameras back then. Yes. So, yes, yes. But, they, but they used the, the um, you had to put in the card. Yes. The card in there and have enough cards and then you have to transfer it to your computer. It's not like today where you just flip it from your phone. Exactly. I had a, I had a cell phone. Right. Like a brick. Like a brick. <laughs> <laughs> I had no. a cell, cell phone. Yeah. No, you know, as I mentioned earlier in, in, you know, during, during this time, I said, you know, Judith has a lot of accolades. She does a lot of different things. You know, now you're in Panama yes. and, you know, I follow your blog. You blog about it and so forth. We have, we have done Jamaican in Panama, but you're, you're there now. And to me, it's almost like from the coldest place <laughs> on the earth, to almost the equator, well, yes. right, right, <laughs> to to the, the, the warmest, warm, well, kind of warm place, mm -hmm. you know. How you, how you liking it? How you liking it in in Panama? Love in Panama. Um, we live in the country, just so everybody knows. We don't live in Panama City. We live in the country, literally the country. We live in Puerto Armoyes, an area that when you said that the Panamanians, they go, who, where, back of God. Yeah, so we, we live close to the Costa Rican border in a small town, beautiful small town, right on the Pacific Ocean, a block from the Pacific Ocean, fresh fish every day, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Uh, just a really wonderful life, really, really wonderful life. Loving it here. Absolutely awesome. loving it here. Awesome, awesome. Any final thoughts on on Antarctica? Um, and and, yes. and go ahead yes no go ahead with your and no and is there any planned adventures um to another place where you may have heard <laughs> no jamaican has adventure to <laughs> well i don't think there's any other place that no jamaican has ventured to i can but... attest to that <laughs> <laughs> but my next planned major trip um adventure not trip but adventure because i have other trips adventure is really to head now north i want to cross the north pole uh do it from the alaska end from going through the northern lights sleeping at base camp being able to see the northern lights from my bed stuff like that and it was actually planned but covid like everything else but okay. covid so that's, I, I figured I went all the way south. I might as well head all the way north, right? I now live halfway in the middle in that on the equator. So <laughs> I might as well do it all. But so my you, last thoughts, my you last hear, thoughts. You heard I, it here first. You heard it, you here, heard it here first. That adventure. <laughs> so sorry, last thoughts. <laughs> but my last thoughts are, I want people to understand the importance of Antarctica. And so not only do I have a book and a film, but I've been doing exhibits with my, with my photos uh all around the place i just came back from houston and la and you know we have i have exhibits planned all over and we've i've done jamaica where i talk about the importance of antarctica to the world because 80 percent of all the water in the world is locked up there in ice so you know climate change is a serious thing global warming is a real thing and i want people to understand that that we have to not just take care of the portion of the planet we live in but we have to look to the portion of the planet that we don't even remember about and take care of the whole entire planet. So that's important for me. Um, JamaicanOnIce.com is where people can go to learn about what I'm doing, see some of the pictures, watch the film, or better yet, check me out on YouTube, you know, do the follow and read. I'm Barefoot Island Girl J. So they can check <laughs> I, Listen, I tell, that is how I describe myself. I lived in America for a long time. I just couldn't become American. I tried, I really tried. But I'm, in my heart, I'm just a barefoot island girl who love walk past sand with no shoes on. That is just who I am. Give me a coconut tree, some coconut water, uh, put me underneath a tree with a book and I'm the happiest person on the planet. So it's barefoot island girl, J.A. 
but Jamaican on ice dot com is where you can learn more and you know watch the film and all that kind of good stuff well judith listen thank you very much for sharing your experience telling us your story of, of uh, visiting antarctica and i hope it inspires some folks um you kind of got me my interest peaked a little bit and check it and, out you know you never know but i appreciate the time that you have spent um you know, you and I will catch up. And and so thank yes. you all. Be sure to visit her website and, and check her out. Judith, take care, my dear. Thank you. See you in Panama. All right. <laughs> Show some love now. Hit that like button. Subscribe to our channel. And hit that notification bell. That way you don't miss a video.